The Baltimore Ravens and San Francisco 49ers match up on a Christmas night game on Monday. And we talk about the key storylines, biggest matchups, and a lot more. And whether this is a potential Super Bowl preview on this crossover Thursday edition of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker, Ravens Wire, here with you on Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you so much for being here and making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. We are free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes over in video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by Prize Picks. And you can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Use code to lowercase locked on NFL for a first boss match up to $100. Prize picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. We are back here with another episode of the show. And this is a crossover Thursday and one for the ages. As the Ravens and 49ers will play on Christmas night. Pegged by many to be the game of the year. We're going to be looking at the biggest stories, the key matchups, predictions, and also past the victory with Brian Peacock of Locked On 49ers. And if this is a potential Super Bowl preview, so without any further ado, let's not get into our conversation with Brian now. This is a fun one, man. This is what it's all about. You get prime time, you get all the eyeballs, you get everybody uh, all fed and, and having festivities and the family around and you know, playing snow football, depending on where you are, not in California, uh, you know, during Christmas between the games. I'm pumped for this one, Kevin. Yeah, it should be exciting. I think there's not a lot of argument anymore, Brian, that you can argue the NFC runs through San Francisco now and the AFC runs through Baltimore. Both those teams now, it's best on best, and that's what you wanted. The NFL got, got this one right. I think when you look at what's going to happen on this one, both fan bases are hoping that their team will not ruin the end of their Christmas with a disappointing loss. But either way, you know, this could potentially be a Super Bowl preview. And not only just that, maybe the MVPs on the line between Brock Purdy and Lamar Jackson. I think that's the biggest storyline is MVP. This is one and two in MVP voting right now, or one in MVP odds. Our friends at FanDuel, we'll talk about them a little bit. Um, one and two in MVP odds with Brock Purdy and Lamar Jackson. And the two best teams, the one seed in both leagues, the they're both eleven and three coming into this one. The Ravens are really good on the road, six and one away record this year. The 49ers are good at home, five and one at home too. So this isn't a matchup where you know a oh, home team is really good and then you know the, the the road team struggles. It is a long trip for the Ravens to come all the way to Santa Clara to play the 49ers at Levi Stadium. Uh, but you know I, I can't wait for this one. This is what it's all about and. Should we do the? Should we make the arguments for for our guys for MVP? Unless unless yeah, you're Team definitely. Brock, which I assume you're probably Team Lamar <laughs> for MVP right now. Um, what what makes Lamar Jackson the MVP of the league this year? Well, here's my thing with it, Brian. I think when you talk about the three words, right, most valuable player, and what that means, I think when you look at the award as it has been perceived, whether it's in national media or whatnot, you look at the box score stats, right? And in passing yards and passing touchdowns, obviously Brock Purdy has that advantage and it's not really close, right? He's he's had that. But my thing is teams that throw the football more versus teams that throw the football less, obviously the teams that throw it more are going to have more passing yards. And I'm not trying to take away from anything that Brock has done this season. I actually am a very big Brock Purdy guy. But I think with the 49ers roster, I think all the questions in the offseason – where we know this roster is insane. The 49ers roster is deep everywhere, but can they just get the quarterback? If they can get the quarterback right, that guy can take them to where they need to go. With Lamar, I think if you take him off of the Ravens versus if you take Brock off of the 49ers, I think there is a steeper drop-off, a much steeper drop-off if you take Lamar off of the Ravens. And I think the Ravens did a pretty good job of surrounding Lamar. They brought in Zay Flowers and Noah Beckham. But I think when you talk about most valuable player, I've been saying it for years now. It's not only this year. I think Lamar is the most valuable player in the league in terms of what the ceiling and floor is when he's on the team versus when the ceiling and floor is when he's off the field or off the team. So to me, I think that you also have to look at eye test. You also have to look at the value of that player. There are a bunch of things that go into it, but I think what's going to really matter is the head-to-head -head record. And we saw it in the NBA last year, right? Nicole Jokic, Joel Embiid, Embiid beats Jokic in Philly and then doesn't play in Denver. I think that had a really big impact on the award. 
So if Lamar beats Brock or Brock beats Lamar, I think for me, that's probably the guy that's going to win it because both guys are having great seasons, but I think in, in different ways, it doesn't take away what either's done. But I think that my, my reasoning for being team Lamar is I just think he is the most valuable player in the league when you break down what the phrase means. Yeah, I love Lamar Jackson, and you can't argue what he means to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and it's a good point, too, about, you know, you never know how voters are going to vote. These are human beings all voting for sort of a story. And, and how's that story play out? If Brock Purdy's really good, you know, in a primetime game against Lamar Jackson, that's probably enough. And vice versa, if Brock struggles in this game, you're going to see the voting favorites switch to the other side and be Lamar Jackson. That's just the way I think this is going to go. And it's pretty fascinating. To be honest with you, it's more impactful for the MVP race than it is for the one seeds in the AFC and the NFC because both these teams now have a little wiggle room and they might have some more important games within the conference coming up after this game, which is pretty fascinating as well. Yeah, it's really funny because I think this is such an important game for the Ravens, but also it's not important at all. <laughs> it's it's, it's right. both ways because how the Ravens from their side of things, how they end their season is obviously with this game on Christmas. But then you have the Dolphins and Steelers week 17 and week 18. If you lose to San Francisco, if Baltimore drops this game, they can still beat Miami and still beat Pittsburgh and get the one seed. It doesn't really matter because I kind of rank losses. My everydayers know there's three tiers. A non-conference loss is the loss that hurts you the least. I mean, it stinks to lose the game, right? You never want to. But in terms of conference tiebreakers, division tiebreakers, doesn't really matter. Then the conference losses are the second worst. And then obviously divisional losses are the most catastrophic. But with it, for a game that I think means so much in terms of statement, I mean, it's a statement game for both teams here where if you can go out there and make a statement again against the best team in the other conference, when it comes to maybe a potential Super Bowl preview, you kind of have the one up. And I think it's just kind of a feeling out process. I mean, we can look at the stats. The Morris 19 and one against the NFC in his career. He could, and I really need the Ravens to win this game so I can keep pushing my agenda. Brian, do you know who the one quarterback Lamar Jackson has lost to in the NFC in his career? It is the funniest stat you will ever hear. Not, is it someone like Nick Mullins? Daniel Jones. Oh, Daniel Jones. That's what <laughs> it I, is I, my I, favorite I stat. Because I remember it was the 18 and one or whatever. And uh they, they you know it was close against the the Rams. What was that two yeah. weeks ago? Or was that last was that last week? Week week 14, yeah. yeah. Week 14. Okay, yeah. Uh and so um yeah it's <laughs> It's it's hard to play against Lamar Jackson because even like the 49ers just played against Kyler Murray and he's an athletic quarterback and they did a really good job against him. Um, the, by the way, the 49ers, you better hope the 49ers don't put the blueprint out there on how to beat a team like they did against Jalen Hurts and the Eagles because the Eagles haven't won a game since. And so you started watching this team like maybe they did put the, the blueprint out there. Uh, but it's it, it's it's just, he's such a difficult player to play against. And if you don't have uh, if you don't have experience playing against him, it's just different. And so I, I think it is going to be a feeling out process. When you talk about Brock Purdy and his, you know, MVP type season and why I would vote for Brock Purdy, uh, you mentioned it with the with the ceiling thing. And the 49ers have been good and the 49ers have been close. And the 49ers have gotten some decent quarterback play in the past from Jimmy Garoppolo and, you know, at times others. And, and Kyle Shanahan and the weapons around those quarterbacks can help them play up a little bit. But it's so different with Brock Purdy. And he has raised the ceiling of the entire franchise. And it's blown me away at what the difference he's made and how good he is. And you really have to watch him a lot because if you watch him from afar, you might see some highlight catch and runs and you might think, oh, yeah, he's not that impressive. And it's everybody else that's doing it. But then you see him facilitating multiple, maybe three different thousand yard receivers in this offense this year. And you see how he goes through his progressions and finds the right guy over and over and over again. And the anticipation to get throws out and get where he needs to, even though he doesn't have a huge arm, he still throws a nice deep ball and puts it out where he needs to put it and puts it out with timing in Kyle Shanahan's offense. You see it all come together and you realize the, the high level of difficulty with some of the things he does, even though it's harder to appreciate, I think sometimes than someone who puts up, you know, some very obvious highlight level plays every week and they, they get broadcast out there on a national level. So th that's what I love about Brock Purdy right now. And um, he's so fun to watch. And man, this team is humming. Uh, we're looking at uh, DVOA next, how these teams stack up. I want to talk a little bit about that and, and just some of the matchups here because these teams are are really good. And I think this is going to be a fun chess match between the coordinators and, uh, and the quarterbacks versus those defenses in this game. Next. Today's crossover episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. All of the lines we reference here, five and a half, by the way, 49ers, pretty big favorites in this one. Might be a surprising number to some. You can bet on that at FanDuel, America's number one 
Sportsbook. And as the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot at FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's a thousand. That's a hundred. That's a that's 150 bucks if your team wins. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. The app is super easy to use, wide range of betting options. And if you get that extra 150 bucks, you can bet on NFL spreads, player props, over unders. You've got NFL draft futures as well um the next coach to get fired coaches of the year mvp you can bet on and find those odds for sure of course uh um in uh, nba and nhl that are going on right now motorsports all of it you can find at fanduel fanduel.com slash locked on again that is fanduel.com slash locked on fanduel official partner of the nfl So we talk about these teams that are the one seed in both division. Kevin Ostreicher of Locked On Ravens. Brian Peacock of Locked On 49ers. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Love doing these crossovers, Kevin. Um, and I'm looking at just other stats. I'm just like, okay, how do these teams stack up? We know they have the best records in the NFL. And so I went over to the DVOA, and, and I'm looking at the, you know, the value over average stats here and the 49ers are one in the league who's two in the league it's the baltimore ravens in total dvoa and then you look at the offense versus the defense 49ers offense right now number one in the league in dvoa they're going to be going against the number two defense in dvoa in the baltimore ravens number one is actually the cleveland browns i thought it might have been the baltimore ravens they're actually number two right now in dvoa and then you look at the other side of the ball it's going to be the number four offense in the NFL, according to DVOA, in the Baltimore Ravens against the number four defense in the NFL. So it's one versus two with the offense versus defense, then four versus four offense versus defense, one and two teams in the league, and just about any metric, whether it's eyeball test, record, whatever it is, I mean, that's that's phenomenal. I, I, I'm so pumped for this one. What are the key matchups to you, uh, you know, the games inside the game that you're excited about on Monday? Well, I'll do I'll do some numbers, too. I think that for me... I think the running games are going to be really important for both teams. These are top five rushing offenses, both San Francisco and Baltimore. San Francisco right now is number five in terms of the yards per attempt on the ground. Baltimore right now is number two. But then you have both teams run defenses, which are in the middle, at least in yards per attempt, towards the bottom of the league. San Francisco comes in at number 19. The Ravens come in at number 21. Now, I think there is some context to both of those numbers for both sides, both the Ravens and the 49ers. But the Ravens just lost Keaton Mitchell. They are turning into a stud running back. He is that speed element guy. It's a big loss for him. They're going to have to rely on Gus Edwards a lot more against the San Francisco defensive line that is just scary regardless of who is out there, whether reinforcements come or not. They, they have bodies on that line. But so do the Ravens. I mean, they have big Michael Pierce and Justin Matabike, and obviously we know about that running back. He's just a, he's a, he's a little good. He's a little good in Christian McCaffrey. Oh, so right. I'm excited for both of the of both of these matchups in the trenches. I think it starts up front. You can even go a step further and talk about the offensive lines because the Ravens. It's so weird for me to say this, Brian, but they have a Ronnie Stanley problem, and it's really big. Ronnie Stanley has not been good this season. He gave up, I believe, six or seven pressures against Jacksonville last week on Sunday night. The next, the next closest Raven gave up too. What they're doing here is Ronnie Stanley has been injured for pretty much the whole season. Got injured in week one, came back, got injured again, came back. His knee's been really bothering him. He can't anchor very well anymore. And obviously we know San Francisco and those guys they have on the edge. It's a key advantage point. So they've been doing a rotation with both guys. Morgan Moses also, I think, has been playing hurt. So what they'll do is Ronnie Stanley will start the game and then they'll sub in Patrick McCarry for a drive. And then on the other side, they'll sub in Daniel Filele for Morgan Moses, and then they'll sub both guys back, and then they'll take both guys out, then they'll put one guy. So it's this weird rotation for the entire game, which is just what they have to do at this point because both tackles are just not healthy. So to me, so to me I mean, if you talk about the matchup within the matchup within what I just said with the numbers, the Ravens offensive line, who has been very good on the interior, Kevin Zeitler has been playing great. Tyler Linderbaum is an all-pro at this point. John Simpson's been better. But – I think it has to be the Ravens offensive tackles against those 49ers edge guys. And right now I think the 49ers have a huge advantage there. And Lamar Jackson, we know he can escape anything. He, if there is a quarterback that can escape those guys, make defensive lines frustrated, it is Lamar, but he can only do so much. He he needs help from his tackles and he needs it definitely on Sunday or on Monday night here on Christmas against the 49ers. You know, it's funny. I brought that up in the past and I always wondered why offenses don't rotate 
their their offensive linemen or their tackles more like like they do with receivers or running backs and have like third down tackles that are better pass blockers but aren't good run blockers. It's third and long, you know what you're doing. Put your uh, your pass blocking tackles in. I don't think the Ravens necessarily are, are doing it because of that reason. So, um, but that is fascinating. And yeah, look, the 49ers have built their whole program around the strength of their defensive line. And so, if you've got problems up front, that's usually an advantage for the 49ers. But I've been really impressed by the the defensive line because I, I, you know, I, I, for those locked on Ravens listeners, I'm sure the locked on 49ers listeners have heard me talk about it a lot. And, and some of them are subscribers and I hope some locked on Ravens listeners are subscribers to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. We talk the entire league every day here. And by the way, you can find Kevin doing, uh, you still do Mondays, right? Locked on NFL. Yep. Mondays on locked on NFL. There you go. And so both of us cover the, the entire league here on the network as well. And, um, the, the Ravens defensive line, you know, coming into the season, it was like, oh, they're always going to be good up front in the offensive line. You got Linderbaum at center now and Ronnie Stanley. And there's like, oh, well, I'm not sure about the defensive line. The defensive line has really come together, especially that pass rush for the Ravens this year. It's been one of the big strengths for that team, especially the way Clowney's playing right now. And um, so they're going to be good up front, and the 49ers are going to have their hand full, and especially with, you know, the 49ers having their strongest player on the left side in, in Trent Williams. Uh, in fact, Two weeks ago, the 49ers had 140 yards rushing to the left side of their offensive line, or Christian McCaffrey specifically had 140 yards to the left side, negative two yards running to the right side. Wow. So uh, they're they're nearly unstoppable running to the left, and they're just like pretty good running to the right and sometimes below average running to the right. So um, that's where they can be beat sometimes, and, and Clowney's that guy that can get those insta sacks. And so Clowney off the left side of the defense versus the right side of the 49ers offensive line and Colton McKivitz. And we'll see if G- George Kittle's over there a lot uh, hanging out with, with Jadavian Clowney. That's, that's an interesting matchup, but really the matchup to me when I thought about this game was the linebackers, the the best combination of linebackers in the NFL on these two rosters, right? Because you got Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw, of the 49ers, and you got queen and Rokon Smith of the, uh, of the Baltimore Ravens. And one of the things that the 49ers love to do aside from running the ball is really tear teams up over the middle of the field. And they, and Kyle Shanahan puts linebackers in a blender and this is the best group of linebackers. And then you consider Williams and Hamilton at safety as well. This is probably the best middle of the field defense. The 49ers have played this year. So I think that's something that's really going to help the Ravens. And I think uh, they might slow down the 49ers offense enough to uh, keep them from going up the 40 points that they've been doing just about every single week right now. So this, this might be a tight contest here. And and I think that's the matchup I'm really interested in Purdy and, and McCaffrey, but almost like Kyle Shanahan versus the linebackers of the Ravens. Yeah. And even you can talk, I mean, Shanahan versus Mike McDonald is, is a big one too. McDonald's yeah. been awesome. Surely we'll be getting some interest as a head coach this offseason because this is now his second full year as the Ravens defensive coordinator. And it's really ever since the Miami, the Miami game week two last year where they blew, I don't even remember because I block it out of my memory. It was like a 28 point lead in the fourth quarter. He's he's settled in and he's done a really good job. And the difference between what Don Martindale was versus what Mike McDonald is, the Ravens are still an aggressive defense. They still blitz, but Don Martindale was very live by the blitz, die by the blitz. There was nothing else in they, if they blitz and they win, great. If they blitz and they lose, great. They, they just live with it. Mike McDonald is, I think, a lot more calculated in what he does. And part of that, you mentioned Kyle Hamilton, is moving Hamilton all around the field. He is their Swiss Army knife. I think he is what Seattle wishes Jamal Adams was. And Jamal Adams is just on a on a downward spiral right now, as, as a lot of people know. But Hamilton s- suffered a sprained MCL in week 14 against the Rams, comes back in week 15, and is arguably their best player on the defensive side of the ball. He has his wingspan is incredible, such long arms, broke up multiple passes. But what Mike McDonald does, he puts him off the edge and blitzes him off the edge. And teams just don't block him. And in the Colts game in week three, he had three sacks in the first half off of the edge where the Colts just refused to block him. Last week against Jacksonville, he stuffed a run on, I think, I think it was a first down run, set the Jaguars back three yards. So teams have to adjust to that moving forward. Kyle Hamilton is someone you have to know where he is on the field at all times. You mentioned Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen too. Roquan Smith has come in and has kind of taken over that like Ray Lewis mentality of of, a leader, physical player, a hard hitter. And the whole defense at this point, they've, they kind of exchanged these finesse guys like Marcus Peters and Justin Houston, more physical players like a clowny who you talked about Rocky Asin who hasn't really played a bunch, but an unsung hero on that defense has been Brandon Stevens 
who played two years at UCLA as a running back, then transferred to SMU and played corner, drafted by the Ravens as a corner, played safety his first year, moved back to corner his second year, was going to play safety this year, but there were so many injuries, he had to play corner. And he has shut down guys across from Marlon Humphrey. And even against Jamar Chase, Marlon Humphrey didn't play in those games. Jamar Chase, seven receptions for 43 yards and a garbage time touchdown. So he's been incredible. This 49ers team we know has weapons all up and down. It, it is Their roster is, I think, one of my favorite rosters in this entire league. But this offense in, in San Francisco versus this Ravens defense, it's best on best, and I think it's going to be great. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. Uh, a couple more little matchups here, and then the paths to victory. How is this thing going to look on Monday night between the, the San Francisco 49ers and the Baltimore Ravens next? Today's episode of Locked On 49ers and Locked On Ravens is brought to you by DoorDash. And whenever I think of football, I think of food. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because I work talking about football. So I think about football a lot, which means I think about food a lot, right? Which might not be the most healthy thing. And it's always at your fingertips with DoorDash. Did the game go to timeout? Time to order with DoorDash. Is it halftime? That's ordering time. Two-minute warning, you got it. That's your cue to order in. You got games on Thursday, got games on Saturday, got games on Sunday, got games on Christmas, Monday. And for me, we were talking about this off the air, Kevin. Um, look, I do a lot on Christmas Eve, and so that's going to be a big day for food. Then I'm already going to hit the, the leftovers early on Christmas Day. So I think pregame for 49ers Ravens, I'm going to DoorDash some Chinese food. What's the DoorDash order for you when it's yeah, it Ravens football season? There are a few spots. I mean, if you want some sushi, Sushi Hana here in Baltimore is really good. They also have some great pizza options on DoorDash, like underground pizza. Really, it's versatile over there. You can't go wrong, but I know that the Christmas Chinese food is a big one for a lot of people. So I might, I might be going sushi this time. Around. Absolutely. And get 50% off up to $10 value when you do. And when you spend $15 or more on your first order, when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change, terms apply. Don't forget, use code LOCK23 for 50% off up to $10 value on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and spend $15 or more. All right, taking a look at this game, uh, one of the things I like to ask the the other hosts when we're doing these crossovers, Kevin, is if there's any secret superstars on the team, the ones that you know maybe the casual fans wouldn't recognize necessarily on the opposing team's roster. And there's a couple of guys we've talked about this week that are you know they're stars on both sides uh, of the the ball for both of these football teams. But there's a couple of guys we talked about, and one is Juwan Jennings. When you see Juwan Jennings, number fifteen in the game. They call it third and Juwan because he's really good on third downs and he's not the fastest guy in the world, but he can get open and he can box you out. And he he's kind of a hybrid wide receiver tight end, but watch out for him blocking. And these 49ers wide receivers block their butts off and it really helps create bigger runs in the run game. And when you see that Juwan Jennings, number 15, condensed split, uh, there's a good chance they're, they're going to try to run uh, in that direction. And then on the other side, the nickel guy, Diamador Lenore, he's just a, he's a bulldog out there and he's kind of played outside. He's played inside and he's just been a really good player. And, and the 49ers secondary doesn't have a lot of big names in it, um, especially with Hufanga out all pro last year and, and the rookie third rounder Jair Brown has stepped in. But um, there's a lot of names out there of players that are really playing up right now. And it's usually when you have a lot of guys that are drafted late showing up and playing well, it's because it's a well-coached football team and both these teams are really well-coached. Who are the, who are the secret superstars in the Baltimore Ravens to look out for Monday? Tennessee and Oregon for those two guys. Those are two of my draft crushes. So I know I know them very well. In San Francisco, we got a couple of good ones. I, I said the Brandon Stevens story earlier. We won't have to go back into that. One offense, one defense. I think Isaiah Likely is someone who has stepped up for Mark Andrews and done really well. Coastal Carolina, fourth round pick a couple of years ago. And we've seen him. Mark Andrews had to miss a couple games last season. And Lamar has really taken a liking to Isaiah Likely. Now, the thing with him is you can put him anywhere. You can put him out wide, put him in the slot, put him in line. And he, he produces. Now, for him, he's someone that has speed. He has wide receiver speed to him. And he has that big body. We saw the catch against Jacksonville on Sunday night where Lamar made the magical, spectacular play. Isaiah Likely goes and he boxes out two guys and makes a contested catch. So he's been really good for him because Mark Andrews is no small loss. I mean, he arguably outside of Lamar Jackson is their most important offensive player. So Isaiah likely stepped up in a big way and he might not be a household name, but he, he is certainly someone that has been big for him on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think it's a secret. He's a superstar anymore, but just a matter of BK has been, I mean, I can't say enough about him. He showed the flashes 
in the first couple of years of his career, but never really put together a consistent season. And I mean, he picked a heck of a time to do it because this is a contract year. I think we've surpassed the uh, the $15 million per year territory. We're into 20, 25 million per year for him. And people might be saying, "Who? I don't know this guy's name. Who is he? Well, he has 12 sacks this season, has 11, uh, at least half a sack in 11 straight games now. He is a guy that he has a plan now as a pass rusher, and it's really helped him. Speed rush, convert speed to power, and he gets to the quarterback often. He's a physical player and isn't a traditional, like, you know, 320-pound guy on the interior, but he uses his athleticism very, very well, and he is underratedly strong and can throw guys off of him. And when he wins, he wins hard. He doesn't win every single rep, but he wins really fast when he does, and he does multiple times a game. So that's a guy I look out for for the Ravens in a big way. He is arguably one of the best defensive players now and probably a top three guy on the defense at this point with how he's played. Looking at that fan duel line, 49ers at home favored by five and a half. What do you think about that line, and, and what's this path to Baltimore victory for you? I think it's a, about right. Maybe I do three, four, but I, it's going to be close. I, I don't expect to blow out either way. I think when you have these two teams, they've both played really well this season as evidenced by their record and their place in the standing. But in terms of a path to victory, I think for Baltimore, it's starting fast. And the Ravens haven't really played from behind a ton this year. Did it against Los Angeles in week 14 and, and did a good job of kind of hanging in there. But it's not like they've been down by 18 points in a game and had to come back from that. So if they can, in any game, right, if you get out to a 14-3 to lead or 10 to nothing lead, it can really help your chances, especially with the way this Ravens defense is playing. Now, the San Francisco offense is going to be the toughest task they faced all season. But Baltimore's defense has shown that they can play with a lead. And Baltimore's offense, I think you were expecting from that Greg Roman to Todd Munkin exchange on the offensive coordinator side of things. Oh, the Ravens are just going to throw the ball a ton and they're going to do away with the run game. Well, they've actually implemented a lot of what Greg Roman has done. And they've been, as we talked about, they're the second best rushing team in the league in terms of yards per attempt. So if they can control the clock, be good in the red zone. The thing with Baltimore's defense is that deep touchdown on Sunday night to Jamal Agnew that Jacksonville had might have been the first deep shot touchdown they've had all season because what Baltimore does is it's almost like the bend don't break mentality where they'll let you take short stuff. They'll let you take intermediate, but they're you're, you are not going to beat them deep. And then they tighten up in the red zone. Their philosophy is if we can hold the opponent to either a field goal or no points on every single drive, we trust our offense enough headline by Lamar Jackson to go score more than that team. So for Baltimore, it's not it's not breaking, not giving up deep stuff. And, of course, defending the screens and all the things that San Francisco does so well because this is an offense unlike anything they've seen this season. So it's going to be a test all the way around. These teams are so similar because uh, Crockett and I have talked about it all season long. We're doing our keys to victory. And it's like, you know, it's, it's it play that bully ball, get out in front because uh, the, the, these teams are – and it's not a bad thing to be a really good front runner. And both of these teams are really good front runners. You get the lead, and then you're a good running team, and then you have your whole playbook at your disposal, right? And that's what makes Kyle Shanahan's team so tough to defend against. So you don't want to get one-dimensional and get down early. I think that one's, uh, that one's huge. In this game for me, um, I've got the 49ers. I'm going to go six. I'm going to say they cover it by a half a point. I'm going to go 30 – 24 in this one and if it does come down to field goal kicking though uh obviously the the baltimore ravens have the uh the advantage over most teams there and uh, that would be interesting to see the rookie come up the rookie missed a game-winning kick earlier this year against the cleveland browns and 49ers lost that game it's their first loss of the season after brock purdy actually led a, a potential game-winning drive but they missed the kick to to go win it um, we'll see if the young man, if it is one of those close games in prime time is, is up to the challenge there. So that'll be interesting, but, um, these teams are so similar and I can't wait to see how this plays out. And yeah, look, one seed might not exactly be at stake in this game, but MVP might actually be at stake here. So it's a fun one. I can't wait for it, man. Yeah, I'm excited. I think if, if I give a score, uh, San Francisco is a heck of a team, but I, the way the Ravens are playing right now, I, I can't pick against them. I, I'm going to say Baltimore pulls it out 29 to 24. And I'll say that maybe, look, maybe it just comes down to who has the last turnover, who who makes the last big play. Could come down to one or two things late in the game, and both teams have the playmakers to come out on the right side. Absolutely. You can't give it away against good football teams uh, in the NFL, that's for sure. And the 49ers and the, the Ravens can both make you pay. Brian's great. And this game is going to be great. I think it's going to have a lot of implications. And although it means a lot and not a lot at the same time in terms of seeding and just what it means in terms of a statement, 
could be a really good one. I think it absolutely will be. And this could be an MVP game. Whoever wins it could potentially win the MVP. That's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show. Coming out tomorrow, we will be rounding out the week by talking about that MVP award in a little more detail and a lot more. So be sure to stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.